Dr. Shabir, so happy to have you on here. Pleasure to be on. You know, Dr. Shabir, the most common question that we get from viewers is about interfaith marriage. And it's not, you know, a sort of intellectual discussion that they want to get into. It's their personal lives. So they're concerned, you know, they want to marry someone or somebody in their family wants to marry someone who is not a Muslim, perhaps. And they want to know what the Quran says about it. So I thought we could talk in this se segment about, you know, what does the Quran say about interfaith marriage and go through some of the verses that are available to us and discuss what they actually mean. So let's start with the first verse, uh, Dr. Shabir. So that's um, verse five, uh, Qur the Quran, chapter five, verse five. So tell me what that verse says and how we can understand it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the verse basically says that the food of the people of the book is uh, permissible for you Muslims. And at the same time, your food is permissible for them. And uh, it is permissible for you to marry chaste believing women uh, and, and also, uh, but, but here, here is men, women of the believing Muslim community, and, and also permissible for you to marry are women, uh, chaste women from among the people who have received the scripture before you. Uh, uh, so long as you are uh, paying the dawah uh, and uh, you are uh, taking them in decency in, in marriage, uh, as opposed to like having paramours or girlfriends uh, on, on the side. Mm -hmm. So this verse seems to say that men can marry women who are not Muslims then? Uh, at least women who are from the Jewish and Christian communities. Mm -hmm. More generally, those who are classified as Ahlul Kitab or people of the, of the scripture. Mm -hmm. And uh, most commonly, people of the scripture are understood by Muslims to be Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. So women are not included explicitly here then? Yes, it, it doesn't say in the reverse that, uh, that women, uh, Muslim women, could marry uh, persons outside of the faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, th this particular verse does not. Okay. So let's... Do you want to say something about this verse or move on to the next verse? Well, we can move on, but I just want to uh, cap my last statement by saying that, in fact, th there, there is no verse in the Quran that explicitly says that a woman could marry someone outside of the, of the faith. Okay, okay. So let's move on then. Then there's, cha there's the Quran, chapter 2, verse 221. What does that say? So this one basically says that uh, the... You, you should not, again, addressing men. Much of the Quran is addressing men to mm -hmm. the extent that uh, on one occasion it is reported that uh, one of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, our mother of the faith, in the faith, uh, Umar Salma, uh, has said to him, you know, all these verses are addressing men, like what's in there for us? And then uh, there is a verse specifically in the, the 33rd chapter of the Quran, which mentions men and women, men and women, men and women, uh, repeatedly to just make the point that uh, when the Quran is speaking, it really really means men and women. So we'll have to come back to that and think about the flip side of what we have just discussed about that permission given for men mm -hmm. to marry outside of, of the faith. And one might ask, I think you're, you're waiting to ask that too. Like, <laughs> That's coming up. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, yeah, so, so one would ask about the flip side, but we'll come to that. All right, so this, this particular verse actually mentions it both ways now, the one that you're asking about, the 221st verse of mm -hmm. the second chapter. Uh, it says, La uh, mushrikati hatta yu'min. Do not uh, you men marry uh, polytheistic women uh, until uh, they believe. Um, uh, and, and it goes on to say that a, a servant girl uh, who is a believer is better for you to marry than to marry a polytheistic free woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it mentions the flip side. And do not uh, give your, your females in marriage to uh, the polytheistic men until they believe. And again, it, it goes into the, the subtopic of that by saying that the uh, believing uh, a servant uh, is uh, better to marry than uh, to marry a polytheistic man. And then it says, yaduna ila nar. Oh, So this gives the uh, rationale for, for this religious uh, ruling uh, that those are the people who are uh, 
calling you towards the hellfire. Wallahu yad'ukum ilal maghfirati, ilal jannati wal maghfira. God, on the other hand, is calling you towards paradise and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So the, the rationale here, obviously, is that if, if you marry a person outside of the faith, that person may call you away from the faith, in any case, might influence you even if they're not calling you directly, away from your faith. And uh, that could, from a religious point of view, mean that you end up in, in the wrong place in the life hereafter, which would be a disaster, the, the, the worst mm -hmm. of all calamities uh, for this the, the serious Muslim believer. Mm -hmm. So what is believing servant or, or slave or whatever is being used here in this verse? What, is, what does that mean? Uh, here, it, there seems to be a distinction between the Muslim community that is referred to as the believing community and, and, and all else. So, okay. so it does not mean that there are no believers outside of the Muslim community. Of course, there, there are people who believe in God. There are people who believe sincerely in their own faiths and so on. And we would we would call them believers. We would call them faithful people, people of faith. Uh, but the, the communities were divided in the time of the Quranic revelation, and uh, communities were called by various names. So, what was the Muslim community going to be called? Nowadays, of course, we call ourselves the Muslim community, but in those early days, uh, they were just simply called the believers, mm -hmm. the uh, Aladina Amanu. Those who believe. And they were distinguished from the people of the book. Uh, so that's Jews right. And, Jews and Christians, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically the verse is saying, marry someone from within your believing community. Mm -hmm. And definitely do not marry a polytheist. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, something is wrong with, with polytheists today. Uh, I'm just saying this is the way in which... The verse uh, frames the, it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In the social and historical context in which uh, the Quran was revealed. Okay. So then there's this last verse, which we which refers to, possibly refers to interfaith marriage. And it's from Surah 60, chapter 60, verse 10. And it talks about women who are refugees, it seems. Yeah, so to understand that verse, let me first paint the background so we see the historical context. The Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace uh, was born in Mecca, and when he began preaching, he was met with persecution. And the few followers who dared to pick up his message and, and follow him were also persecuted. So it was not uh, feasible for them to remain there and to uh, have a viable faith as a community. Uh, they had to keep their faith a secret uh, when they uh, embraced the faith in order to escape persecution. So mm -hmm. people started to migrate on the Prophet's direction. Some migrated to Abyssinia, and uh, eventually a Christian king there in Abyssinia gave them refuge and protection, uh, but that was not enough. The Prophet, peace be upon him, himself uh, had to migrate, and he migrated to Medina, a city 400 kilometers uh, to the north uh, of uh, his birthplace, Mecca. And uh, there in the new community, many uh, of his followers joined him, uh, migrating away from Mecca, and many others uh, came to rally to his call. Uh, but uh, the enemy forces kept marching against his new city uh, to attack and decimate the Muslims. So there were many battles in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his uh, followers uh, stood in defense uh, against uh, the invaders. Um, so in that situation now, we have this verse that you refer to from mm -hmm. the 60th chapter, which is referred to as Surat al-Mumtahana, uh, which means uh, the women whose faith faith are to be tested. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the background of this shows that, and, and the verse itself now shows that if the women migrate, so we already spoke about people migrating away from Mecca uh, to escape that situation of persecution, and in any case, to join the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his new founded community. Uh, so when, when the men migrated, there did not seem to be any, any problem because men in those days were very independent and uh, you know they were to be recognized with, but uh, women were more protected in that traditional society. So uh, if a woman was going to migrate, you can imagine the Meccans uh, being up in arms over this, like who's taking you know, our females here? You know? And they would want to exert control over, over their, their females. Uh, so when they did happen to migrate, escaping dangerous circumstances, fleeing for their lives, and arriving safely at Medina, now what was to be done? 
Uh, so the, the, that, that's one aspect of it. Now, another aspect is that in that traditional society, I've already mentioned in this uh, segment uh, the question of a dower being paid. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, when people get married, uh, you know, a lot of marriages are marriages out of love. And, uh, you know, if there is an exchange, there is an exchange of rings on both sides. Uh, the idea of a dower, which uh, was very prevalent up until a couple of hundred years ago, where a woman was given a sort of financial financial asset to guarantee her, her financial uh, ability within uh, the marriage, especially in case the marriage should fail. Uh, this was in vogue. It was referred to as a dower. Uh, a man might give over a sizable piece of estate to his uh, bride at the time of the, of the marriage, and this becomes her own property. So now, in that traditional society, you can well imagine that, let's say, uh, a man gave a sizable dower to a woman, and uh, so they got married. And now the woman says, you know what, I'm a Muslim now and I'm going to leave you. And, and she leaves and goes to join the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this was a question that this passage is addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, what should be done uh, about that dower and about the marriage itself? Uh, so the, the Quran basically says, when these women come to you, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you are to ask them some basic questions. Are you pledging uh, to stay away from all the transgressions that, that are known to be uh, in, uh, uh, taboo in the Islamic faith? Mm -hmm. So you have to give up all of these evil things. Are you really pledging to do all of this? And if you see that, that yeah, they are sincere, they are really pledging to really, they're not just nominal Muslims, they sincerely want to be Muslims and follow the Islamic dictates, well then, uh, you retain them in your community, uh, but you have to now uh, send back the dower that, that they might have received uh, in, in, in a recent marriage. So, uh, so, so that's to make sure that everything is done fairly and squarely. Now this is remarkable because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in that situation uh, was uh, a, you know, a persecuted prophet and he could have said, okay, so they're persecuting us. We have no responsibility towards them. But the Quran is saying, no, you do have a responsibility. You cannot just take your money and run. So if this woman who uh, is, is leaving her community and her husband, she comes to the new community, if she had received the dower, especially a sizable one, uh, then she should return the dower and then she can be free to stay in the new community. Mm -hmm. So, and then the, but she the can't crucial- be returned back to her original husband. Well, well, this is the, now the crucial part of the verse that relates to our topic okay. at, at hand. Uh, the, the, the verse says that these women uh, are, uh, are not uh, lawful for them, meaning for the polytheists, nor are the polytheists lawful for the women. Now, does that mean lawful in marriage? Uh, or does it mean that it is not right in this situation to send them back? After you have tested them and, and they have pledged and you see their sincerity as new Muslims, uh, it, would it be right to send them back? Forget about marriage now. We're mm -hmm. just talking about the, the, the justice of this. Okay. And, and so maybe this is one meaning that it is not lawful. Uh, it, it is not permissible. This would be a haram act. This would be like unthinkable for you to send them back in that situation, especially after they had escaped. Because after they had escaped and they have come to you, if you send them back, they're going to be subject to, to ter uh, perhaps torture, but in any case to, uh, to abuse, at mm -hmm. least uh, verbal abuse and, and most likely physical abuse as well. Because basically, when one left his community or her community in that circumstance, one would be seen as uh, having betrayed the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it would not be taken lightly. So it would have been a haram act to send them back to the community uh, from which they had actually escaped. So maybe that's the meaning of the verse. But let's say the meaning of the verse is that it's not permissible for them uh, to, be, to go back to the marriage with their polytheistic husbands, seeing that they are now Muslims. Well, that would not be anything newly discovered after we have just discussed uh, the verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, the 221st verse, which says that neither men nor women from the believing Muslim community can marry a polytheistic uh, person. Uh, so we're, we're at the same uh, um, conclusion here. And then what uh, sticks out from this general discussion about marrying polytheists is the verse that we, we first discussed, mm -hmm. the one from Surah 5. Uh, and which happens to be verse number five as well, uh, that says that men 
believing Muslim men could marry uh, women from among the people of the book. Mm -hmm. So there's a differentiation here within the rules about men and women. So let's get back to that. Um, I think in the, in the next segment where we're going to do part two, okay. we're going to talk a little, little bit more about the context of the verses and also um, how we can apply and understand it today. Thank sure. you for, for your thoughts, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome.